Working the graveyard shift at Moe's Diner was usually uneventful. The familiar aroma of coffee brewing and bacon frying in the back was my nightly comfort. It was just past midnight when he walked in. Tall, lanky, with wild eyes and disheveled clothes, he looked like he hadn't slept in days. The sour, pungent odor that clung to him made my stomach turn. Hey there, he rasped. Got any coffee? Sure thing, I replied, forcing a smile. As I poured him a fresh cup, the rich aroma temporarily masked his stench. Rough night? You could say that. He took a long sip, his eyes darting around the diner. There was something about him that set my nerves on edge. What's your name? I asked, trying to keep the conversation light. Jake, he said after a pause, his gaze locking onto mine with an unsettling intensity. Nice to meet you, Jake. I'm Sam. You passing through? Yeah, just needed a break, he replied, his eyes flicking towards the door every few seconds. We made small talk, but his answers were curt and vague. The smell of him was becoming unbearable. And just as I was about to ask if he wanted something to eat, I heard the distant sound of sirens. Jake's eyes widened, his grip on the coffee mug tightening. The sirens grew louder, sending a chill down my spine. The regulars in the corner looked up, puzzled. What's going on? One of them asked. I didn't know. I walked to the window and saw police cars surrounding the diner. Officers, guns drawn, positioned themselves around the entrance. I turned back to Jake, my pulse quickening. What's happening? I whispered. Before he could answer, the door swung open and a police officer stepped inside. Everyone, stay calm. We're looking for an escaped convict. He's dangerous. Jake stood up abruptly, knocking over his mug. Coffee spilled across the counter, mingling with the smell of his sweat and the metallic scent of fear. Jake, sit down, I said, trying to keep my voice steady but Jake's eyes were wild with panic. I can't go back, he muttered, more to himself than to me. I won't go back. In an instant, he lunged at me, his hands reaching for my throat. The world seemed to slow down. All I could think about was his sour smell and the desperation in his eyes. I stumbled back, fear gripping me. Before he could reach me, the police swarmed in. They tackled him to the ground, pinning him down with practiced efficiency. The regulars watched in stunned silence. The diner was filled with the sounds of grunts, the clinking of handcuffs, and the smell of sweat and fear. Jake struggled against the officers, his face contorted with rage and desperation. You don't understand, he screamed. I had no choice. They made me do it. The officers ignored his pleas, hauling him to his feet and dragging him toward the door. One of them turned to me his expression softening. Are you all right? I nodded, my hands still trembling. Yeah, I think so. Good, we'll need you to give a statement, he said. Is there anyone else here? Just a couple of regulars, I replied, my voice shaky. The officer nodded and motioned for his colleagues to secure the area. The tension in the diner began to dissipate, replaced by a lingering unease. The smell of fear and sweat still hung in the air, mingling with the familiar scents of coffee and bacon. As they led Jake out, he turned to me, his eyes filled with a mix of anger and sorrow. Remember what I said, Sam? They made me do it. It's not over. His words sent a shiver down my spine. I watched as he was shoved into the back of a police car. The officers began to disperse, some staying behind to take statements and secure the scene. I sat down at the counter, trying to process what had just happened. The smell of coffee was comforting, but the events of the night had left a mark on me. The regulars came over, their faces filled with concern. You okay, Sam? One of them asked. Yeah, I replied, forcing a smile. Just another night at Moe's Diner, right? They chuckled, but the laughter was strained. Tonight was different. The smell of fear and the memory of Jake's wild eyes would haunt me for a long time. As I cleaned up the spilled coffee and tried to restore some sense of normalcy, 
I couldn't shake the feeling that Jake's warning was more than just the ravings of a desperate man. The 4th of July had always been my favorite holiday. The smell of barbecue, the sound of laughter, and the sight of fireworks lighting up the night sky. It all felt like a celebration of life and freedom. It was like any other Independence Day. The sun was high in the sky, and the air was filled with the scent of grilled meat. I could hear children's laughter as they played with sparklers. My friends and I had planned to drive out to the old abandoned fairground on the edge of town. It was a place of local legend, said to be haunted by the ghosts of those who had died in a tragic accident decades ago. We thought it would be fun to spend the night there before watching the fireworks to give ourselves a little scare. The air was thick with the humidity and decaying wood. The place felt forgotten, lost to time. We parked the car and stepped out. Are you sure this is a good idea? I asked, my voice barely above a whisper. Come on, it's just for fun, my friend Mike said, grinning. What's the worst that could happen? We traveled deeper into the fairground, past rusted rides and broken down stalls. The atmosphere grew heavier, the air colder. My skin prickled with unease, and the hairs on the back of my neck stood on end. The sky began to darken, the sun started setting. As we explored, I caught a whiff of something foul, like rotting garbage. I wrinkled my nose, trying to ignore the nauseating smell. We found the old ferris wheel, its metal frame creaking in the wind. Suddenly, a chill ran down my spine, and I felt an overwhelming urge to leave. We should go, I said, my voice trembling. Before anyone could respond, a loud crash echoed through the air, followed by a series of drunken shouts. At first, I thought it was fireworks, but the sound was too close, too aggressive. Then, the screaming started. My heart pounded in my chest as I turned to see a figure stumbling out of the shadows, a man with wild eyes and a bottle in his hand. Panic surged through me, and I instinctively ducked behind a nearby stall. The air was thick with the acrid smell of alcohol, mixing with the sickly sweet scent of decay. We need to get out of here, I shouted, my voice barely audible over the chaos. My friends scattered, running in all directions. I could hear their frantic footsteps, their desperate cries. The drunkard's laughter echoed through the fairground, a chilling sound that sent shivers down my spine. I crawled on my hands and knees, trying to stay hidden, my breath coming in short, sharp gasps. As I made my way towards the exit, I stumbled upon Mike, crouching behind a cotton candy cart. My stomach churned, and I felt bile rise in my throat. I wanted to scream, to cry, but there was no time. I had to keep moving. The smell of smoke filled the air as fires broke out around us, the dry wood of the old structures catching quickly. I could see the flicker of flames, feel the intense heat on my skin. My eyes stung with smoke, and I struggled to breathe coughing as I stumbled forward. I found myself at the edge of the fairground near the entrance. I could hear sirens in the distance growing louder. Relief washed over me, but it was quickly replaced by a new fear. The drunk man was still out there, and I wasn't safe yet. I ducked behind a ticket booth, my heart pounding in my chest. The smell of burnt popcorn and hot metal filled my nostrils. I peered out trying to see where the drunkard was, but the smoke and darkness made it difficult. Suddenly he appeared just a few feet away. His eyes were wild, his face twisted in a maniacal grin. He raised his bottle, slurring curses and threats. Time seemed to slow down, and I felt a cold wave of dread wash over me. In that moment, the first firework of the night exploded in the sky, a brilliant burst of red, white, and blue. The drunkard's attention shifted for a split second, distracted by the noise and light. I seized the opportunity, bolting from my hiding place and running towards the flashing lights of the approaching police cars. Help, 
Over here, I screamed, waving my arms frantically. The officers saw me and rushed forward, their shouts blending with the crackle of fireworks and the roar of flames. They apprehended the drunk man, his crazed laughter turning into incoherent mumbling. As they led him away, I collapsed to the ground, my body trembling with relief and exhaustion. The rest of the night passed in a blur. My friends were found and taken to the hospital, some shaken but thankfully uninjured. The fairground was a smoldering ruin, the smell of burnt wood and scorched earth lingering in the air. As I stood there watching the final firework burst into a dazzling display of red, white, and blue, and I felt a surge of pride swell in my chest. We had faced a nightmare and come out the other side. In that moment, I knew that no matter what horrors we might face, the spirit of freedom and resilience that defined our nation. The night began with excitement. I had been looking forward to the horror movie premiere for weeks. As I stepped into the old movie theater, the scent of buttery popcorn mingled with the faint mustiness of aged carpets and seats. The theater was one of those classic, almost regal venues with high ceilings, ornate moldings, and heavy red velvet curtains. It had seen better days, but it still held a certain charm I bought my ticket and grabbed a large tub of popcorn, the buttery aroma filling my nostrils as I made my way to the screening room. The theater was dimly lit, the only illumination coming from the red emergency exit signs and the flickering advertisements on the screen. I found a seat in the middle, perfectly positioned for the best view. The room slowly filled with other moviegoers, their chatter creating a low hum of anticipation. As the lights dimmed further, a hush fell over the crowd. The preview started and I settled into my seat, the plush fabric slightly worn but still comfortable. I could feel the slight stickiness of the floor beneath my shoes, remnants of countless spilled sodas and dropped candy. As the main feature began, the air grew colder, the scent of popcorn now mixed with an inexplicable chill. I pulled my jacket tighter around me trying to shake off the sudden unease that had settled over me. The movie was intense, full of jump scares and eerie music that sent shivers down my spine. I could feel my heart racing, my palms growing sweaty as the tension built. About halfway through the film, during a particularly quiet scene, I heard a faint whisper behind me. I turned, expecting to see someone talking, but the seats were empty. Puzzled, I shrugged it off and turned back to the screen, but the whispering continued, growing louder and more insistent. It sounded like a multitude of voices, overlapping in a cacophony of hushed tones. My pulse quickened and I glanced around, trying to locate the source of the whispers. To my horror, I noticed that the people around me seemed oblivious, their eyes glued to the screen. It was as if I was the only one who could hear it. The voices grew louder, more distinct, filled with words I couldn't understand, but their urgency was unmistakable. Suddenly the screen flickered and the film stopped. The theater was plunged into darkness and a collective gasp rose from the audience. The emergency lights flickered on, casting a ghostly glow over the room. The whispers were now deafening, surrounding me, echoing in my ears. I stood up, my heart pounding and looked around frantically. Then, I saw it. A figure at the back of the theater, shrouded in shadow. It moved slowly, deliberately, its eyes glowing faintly in the dim light. The whispers seemed to emanate from it, growing louder with each step it took towards me. I felt a cold sweat break out on my forehead, and my breath came in short, panicked gasps. The figure continued to advance, and I could now make out its features. Its face was twisted into a grotesque mask of malevolence, eyes sunken and hollow. The air grew colder still, and I could see my breath misting in front of me. 
The smell of decay filled my nostrils, a putrid, sickening scent that made my stomach churn. I backed away, stumbling over the seats, my eyes never leaving the advancing figure. I could feel the cold seeping into my bones, a paralyzing chill that made it hard to move. The whispers turned into a chorus of anguished wails, and I clamped my hands over my ears, desperate to block out the sound. I reached the aisle and bolted for the exit, my heart hammering in my chest. The door seemed impossibly far away, and I could hear the figure's footsteps behind me, slow and deliberate. The smell of decay grew stronger, and I gagged, fighting the urge to vomit. I reached the door and pushed it open, the cold night air hitting me like a slap in the face. I stumbled outside, gasping for breath the whispers finally fading into the night. I looked back, expecting to see the figure following me, but the doorway was empty, the theater silent and still. Shaking, I made my way to my car, my mind racing. The air outside was fresh, the scent of pine trees and damp earth a welcome relief from the stench of decay. As I drove home, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, that the figure was still out there waiting. That night, I lay in bed, unable to sleep. The events of the evening replayed in my mind, and I could still hear the faint whispers echoing in my ears. The smell of decay lingered, a phantom scent that refused to dissipate. As the years passed, the theater was eventually demolished, replaced by a shiny new multiplex. But I never forgot the smell of decay, the cold chill of the air, and the whispers that seemed to come from another world.